in that context where industry and many people in academia were claiming that these genetically modified organisms could be contained, in that context we were working, myself, my lab, and collaborators in other places were working together with indigenous communities in the southern state of Oaxaca in Mexico. And um, we had been working for many years on the intersection of in indigenous rights, indigenous interests, and the new and developing powers of biological intervention, of which this genetic modification or transgenesis became a really central point. So the indigenous people that I was working with um, were asking themselves, okay, so you're telling us that people in the US, people in Europe are crossing maize, corn with bacteria. And I said, yeah. Well, that's really strange, they would say, because that really shouldn't happen. We don't want our corn to be crossed with anything else. We want corn to be corn. And I said, well, yeah, okay. Then they would say, so how are we going to know where, when it comes, when this starts crossing with our corn, because we don't want it. And I would say, you won't know because the corn is going to look the same, but it's going to be transformed internally. This was a very serious problem for them. So they decided to set up a lab, and I helped them set up that lab, in which they could detect the presence of GMOs in their corn plants. Using the PCR reaction, at that time it was something relatively new, and so we helped them set up a lab that was at that time pretty much state-of-the-art for doing microbiology and for doing DNA analysis. And very soon, as soon as they were able to do this, they detected the presence of genetically modified DNA within the plants that they thought were completely their own. And we in the US, in Europe and everywhere else, we had held those places as the repository an origin of corn's diversity. This is the place where corn was first domesticated, where it was first brought into contact with humans, and one of the most important centers of diversification and diversity of corn. So having this genetic contamination coming from industrial corn and genetically modified corn into these crops was a big surprise for many. It was not really a surprise for us, because, as I said, any biologist who knows anything about reproducing organisms would know that sooner or later they were going to cross. But for them, it was a big surprise. It was also a big surprise for the industry, who would, were not really expecting that anybody would be looking on the margins. They were prepared to fight battles and so on, here in the U.S. especially. And they had the whole in institutional setup to wage those battles to defend themselves, but they were not expecting that in the periphery, in the edge, indigenous communities in a remote mountainous area in Mexico, that they would have the capacity to look and to find. And that's what surprised them, and that's what generated a huge amount of um, political debate. Uh, at a time, I have to say, it's the time when the con conventional biological diversity was having to decide what to do about national boundaries, national borders, with regards to genetic resources and with regards to genetic modification. So genetic engineering biotechnology was coming to the place where they were deciding, okay, if you have a genetically modified crop, are you allowed to bring it across international borders or not. So the treaties that led eventually to the Cartagena Protocol and so on were just being conceived of. This idea that we needed to have some regulation. So the discovery of genetically modified corn in Oaxaca by the indigenously established lab and my lab together generated a huge amount of problems 
and really put a wrench in the machinery that was already moving towards deregulating the movement of seeds across international borders to allow biotechnology to spread all over the world.